So hello again, my name is uh, David Pech and I would like to talk about Postgres. Uh, this is like my first virtual conference, so I apologize. I pretty much like to talk to the audience and uh, see some hands raised up, <laughs> which probably won't be the case, but maybe uh, just a question for you, like internally, a rhetorical one, uh, who does run Postgres? Who has any experience with it? This is the first one. Who is able to run it in a container? This is the second one. And the third one, who is so brave enough to run it in the Kubernetes? This is maybe the third one for me from the start. So a little about my background. I am uh, like 20 years in the industry, I guess. I have a vast Java developer experience on the what you would probably call enterprise legacy system. Uh, working, of course, uh, with uh, large databases, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but recently I've moved to the infra infrastructure field. I've become a Kubestronaut. So in case you don't know this particular icon, uh, this means that I have passed some uh, CNCF uh, exams and I do currently specialize in Kubernetes and a lot of other CNCF, let's say, technologies. I do have a vast uh, footprint in the Oracle Cloud and also on AWS. Uh, so I have helped to move several companies through on-prem to either hybrid or fully on cloud. So this is, let's say, my baseline and my experience, what it comes from. So originally, how did I like came to Litmus? This is probably very interesting to, uh, to evaluate because when you run enterprise Java, when you have something like an, like heavyweight application JBoss server, you do have an Oracle DB. Well, you are not going there, right? Uh, like at all, I mean. Uh, then you create your first container, of course, with a Docker file. Then you find that there are other containers that you can talk to through some Docker Compose tooling. Uh, and like I think four years ago, we started to run a production with the Docker Swarm. I'm pretty sure that uh, a lot of you jumped straight into Kubernetes, but for example, like four years ago, when we decided if we are able to do Kubernetes or not, we decided we are not there, not we are far, far away. We don't understand a lot of the details about observability, about resiliency, which I would like to point point out. Uh, so we started with a, let's say, much more lightweight orchestrator. But eventually our customers pushed us a little bit uh, to the Kubernetes. And this is basically when I can see some benefits of uh, engineering uh, like resilience engineering or engineering with litmus tooling something like this because uh, up front i would say that we had of course some tests and a lot of the people talk about that let's say resiliency testing is some extension from the unit testing integration testing this is let's say some some newer level maybe higher level and definitely this works for me in this direction so the docker swarm did not allow us to do it because the the environment was not so ephemeral as I would like, but in the Kubernetes, we started some small, let's say, experiments. But mostly when you have a simple application, typically like killing the pod, uh, dropping the deployment and letting Argo CD or some other tooling recreate it, is typically like, I would say, enough for some basic understanding how your application behaves. Because for example, if you have some like very easy Nginx in front of you, you have some application behind as a backend, something like this. Typically, it's kind of easy to understand what will happen if you have an experience outside of containers, right? Uh, of course, when you have, uh, when you are going much, much closer to the microservice architecture, this gets tremendously different, I would say, uh, but typically it's not the case and people like underestimated what could go wrong, right? We do run 10 services instead of only one previously, what what should be different, right? But it is like very different. So in Kubernetes ecosystem, we have like discovered we need to at least to try to understand better some fail patterns because this has happened in the production. We did have some uh, small outages when deploying a newer version. So we didn't quite understood some of the, uh, let's say Kubernetes primitives at the time. But uh, let's say starting the end of this year, we came fully to or dedicated ourselves fully to the Kubernetes and trying to experiment also with a state for workloads. And this is what I'm talking about today because we uh, would like to run Postgres. And if you can, uh, if you know, I don't know if you, if you are familiar with the topic of running Postgres database inside a Kubernetes, there are multiple operators. 
uh, and of course you are trying to let's say guess which one of them is better this is very difficult because the marketing of all the companies works tremendously well uh, they all say okay you will have a bullet for postgres uh, with us um, nobody else is doing this better so this is very hard to decide and uh, basically what we want to do with litmus was to verify that our mission critical component uh, our database our hard address system will be able to run let's say efficiently and resiliently we also do have some kind of baseline, meaning that we understand how Postgres runs on the virtual machines, like traditional ones, with the Petroni tool. The Petroni tool is some kind of highly available solutions that is around Postgres. I will explain it in a minute. But this is the way how you typically run Postgres clusters, so not only one instance, but multiple ones in the VM world, let's say. So there is like a very <laughs> short list of what the Postgres operator should do for you. Uh, so for example, it should initialize a blank database. Uh, but this is like not that easy if you understand that you have multiple instances of Postgre, you have one primary, multiple replicas, probably you would like to have the dynamic uh, number of replicas so you can add it or, or remove it on demand, something like this. So even this first use case is not, not that obvious at, as maybe you, you would think of. Uh, then we do have a secondary use case that we would like to, for example, clone the production database to use it on some uh, user acceptance environment and test it um, or something similar. Um, also, like, not, that, not that easy uh, with the traditional Postgres because Postgres itself, maybe to explain, does not allow many tooling around it in its core. That's why there is a Petroni, but also a lot of other vendors are trying to push through some of their like solutions. Um, the list goes on and on, but I would say that the Postgres operator should be even mature, meaning smart, in the way how they, for example, upgrade the cluster. So I can give you maybe a very good example, what is very annoying or was very annoying with the, let's say, very earlier implementations of the operators, meaning that if you would like to upgrade to the newest version of the cluster, this means that all your pods need to restart, typically. So you have a primary, you have several replicas. This means that when you restart the primary, it will transfer the primary to some other pod. And if the pod is running the old version, it will be restarted in a few minutes again. And there will be two switchovers instead of only one. So for example, this is like a small use case, but you can see that this is about the maturity of the operator and I will have to admit they are getting much better in it, but they are maybe not there yet. So what should operator not do? Uh, definitely it should not lose your data. Uh, this is much easier said than done. We are not talking just about that the operator itself will like lose uh, all the data directory. We are also talking about that, for example, when you switch the primary to some other pod, it should not lose anything or minimal amount of writes which is not that easy. Of course, there should be always some leader, meaning that you are able to write to your Postgres and not run only in the read mode, etc., etc., etc. So I do have two operators as an example. The first one is called Postgres Operator. It is originally from the company called Crunchy Data. Uh, this is a large Postgres consultancy company, so definitely this is a company that knows how to run Postgres itself. Uh, this is very mature and proven solution that utilizes the Petroni tool. So you can see that this Petroni tool was also used in the VMs and they basically lift and shifted the approach to the Kubernetes. I will explain in a bit. Uh, it uses multiple stateful sets. Uh, this is how the pods are run. And for the Petroni class, let's say, of operators, this is definitely one of the best, I would say. So what is Petroni to explain? Uh, this is the tool that is like a Python script that wraps Postgres and together with some distributed storage, typically at CD, but there are also other options, allow you to run Postgres in a cluster. What does it mean? You create an at CD cluster to have like single point of truth. Then you one by one create, in our case, pods, but originally it were VMs. You create you st or you start a Patroni process or you create a Patroni pod that will ask, okay, am I the first pod in the cluster? Should I be master or should I be replica? 
if I'm the replica, where are the connections to the primary so I can bootstrap from there, etc. So basically what it does is that inside a pod, it runs the Python script as a main process and it spawns either bootstrapping, which is like a PG based backup uh, or some, uh, uh, sorry, PG based backup is, yes. uh, but uh, also other tools like Postgres itself to run. So when you, for example, ask, uh, what is the status of this pod? Is this pod alive? It is not an easy answer because the Python wrapper script might run, might not. Uh, the Postgres might be running, might not be running. So it is much more difficult to understand what it does. Uh, if you would like to control this, the like typical way is to uh, SSH inside the pod and do uh, some Patroni CLI tooling over there. So this is an example how you can switch the leader, meaning that you will switch primary to some other one. Also, there is a lot of tooling just to understand in what status your cluster is. This is some schematics, how the operator runs to understand how we can experiment on it. So there is a stateful set, uh, like the Kubernetes primitive. There are several pods uh, that are spawned by this stateful set. There is the Petroni Python wrapper script that does a lot of tooling around, and the Postgres itself is just some process inside of the pod. Uh, so as you can see, like this is not very easy to understand, and I'm like very much simplifying because I'm not talking how the backup is done, uh, uh, how other, like for example, exporters work, etc., etc. So uh, let's say that the pod is, I would say, heavyweight, and um, it is difficult to understand what is going on. Then we do have a second operator, which is called Cloudinative PG. Uh, this is originally from the company called Enterprise DB. And also this is a company very well known in the Postgres world, like a large consultancy with great track record. And this is a completely different approach. Uh, I would say that this is a cool kit, uh, which is trying to do this really cloud natively. This is probably why they use even the, this is maybe a little bit strange uh, name for it. Uh, so it, they don't use stateful sets at all. They just create pods directly from the Kubernetes controller and they share or they, uh, through the time, they attach the same persistent volume claim, meaning that the pods share the data directory. So for example, if you create a new cluster, a pod is started just initializing the data there. It has, let's say, slash data as the data there, then the pod exits with success, another pod is started with the Postgres process itself. It gets attached to the same pod as the previous one. So let's say it works in a, let's say, very different way than the stateful set. There is no uh, like uh, Patroni tool around it. There is a major process that is true, but it is much more lightweight than previously. And for example, for the experimenting, one thing that you should notice here is that there is no stateful set at all. So this makes experiments, especially in Litmus, uh, much uh, more difficult because it, uh, let's say, expects you to use some amount of Kubernetes primitives. So we wanted to verify uh, which of these operators is better. And um, we came up with the Litmus. Uh, this is, uh, maybe just to explain, this is uh, the uh, OpenAI uh, presentation of the Litmus superhero uh, that will help you with this. Uh, of course, we are trying to run inside of Kubernetes. We are, um, probably do have a good track record with Kubernetes. We do have a lot of good experiences with Kubernetes, but still running a stateful set there or stateful workload is very different from running just your application. Uh, so there always have been some discussion that if the uh, experiments won't prove fruitful, we will tell, okay, we won't go to Kubernetes at all. We will stay with VMs and maybe we will reconsider in several years or something like this. So from our point of view, uh, I think that uh, Natish also men mentioned this one, that we use Litmus as end-to-end -end testing tool for complex system. Uh, so because really, we Postgres itself is very complicated. And if you put an operator orchestrating Postgres on top of it, doing all these things, this is like a level gazillion of complexity. So let's see it from the user perspective, how it behaves. Our approach for this uh, presentation was very simple and I will just like trying to explain uh, very simplified uh, steps that we do, but 
uh, in reality, we did, of course, much more. We created some uh, simple scenarios. As you can see, we tried to restart the primary pod. Uh, this is the pod of the Postgres that is able to write. Then we try to restart the replica pod. We do a plan switchover, meaning that we use uh, some tooling that is available in the CLI to switch the primary from one pod to the other. And then the scenario number four is very interesting. I like it uh, the most because we just kill the pod and we also kill, like force kill, force delete the PVC, meaning that we force this to lose the data. So this is um, maybe not a good simulation, but a simulation, let's say, of some sort that uh, forces the operator to recreate the data. Uh, how did we test? Uh, we created some uh, small demonstration application that is basically looping one select, doing one insert at a time, and it is uh, inserting a number that is incrementing. Uh, then it sleeps for a few milliseconds, something like this. And we run it in several replicas uh, and check how the database reacts and what the applications measures. So the end-to-end -end from our perspective is the client application, which metrics we collect, and then we will decide. Uh, so this is the baseline. So as you can see, there are like four categories that we measure, the select rate. Uh, we also measure the number of failures, meaning that for there is a check in the application that if you select in one iteration uh, a number and in the next iteration you, se you select a lower number, this is a uh, data loss because the number should only grow or so something like this. Uh, very similar, there is the insert rate with very similar checks. So we are able to verify how does the application perceive what is inside the primary Postgres. As you can see, this, uh, this can run for several hours without any disruption, like it is very stable. And let's go to the experimenting and what does it prove? So for the Postgres operator on the left, uh, you can definitely see a very different pattern that for the cloud native PG. So in this scenario number one, we restart the primary pod, which means that we basically force the database to do a failover. What is very interesting, I didn't put it there, but there were no failures, which is very interesting that both operators were able to cope with it with like no downtime from the client application. But as you can see, uh, there are some discrepancies and, for example, the select rate, meaning the uh, number of selects we are able to do per second, is slightly dropping. Not much, but there is some, uh, some drop there. Uh, also, for the Postgres operator, you can see that the performance is going slightly down, which is uh, also very interesting for us to, uh, to research later on. For the second scenario, we just restart the replica pod. This is like the reader pod in Postgres terminology. So we should uh, we expect that there is like no difference. Uh, typically, it is so. So you can see on the graphs when did the restart happen. Uh, the experiment is set up that it does, I think, 10 iterations with two minute gaps or some, something like this. For the third experiment, we do have a switch over and here the results are very interesting because as you can see on the cloud native PG on the right, you can clearly see that the select rate is dropping like significantly then after the experiment or after the cluster is able to get healthy again, it is getting back to the original values. And as I mentioned, the interval between the experiments is like two minutes, something like this. Uh, for the Postgres operator, you are not able to see uh, from the select rate when we did the switching. You are able to see it from the insert rate, of course. So even from, from the developer perspective, these graphs are like very interesting because they are hands-on how the database performs, right? They explain uh, how long does it take to do a fail oh, sorry, a switch over in this case, uh, etc. So you can see that the disruptions are minimal. However, as you can see on the second row, there are some data losses, meaning that when the switch over, which should be a planned operation was done, a small number uh, of inserts was lost. And uh, we are talking about like three, two or something like this inserts per switch, but you can see it quite clearly. Uh, this is a very interesting topic and this is like uh, for our let's say research or maybe this is a known fact for postgres of course and it is uh, the cap theorem just claims that if you run multiple instances of postgres you have either two options you can either prefer availability 
which is the default one, meaning that the Postgres will be uh, able to serve as soon as possible, let's say, with minimal downtime, or you can prefer consistency, meaning that you won't lose any data. In the Postgres itself, there is a setting that you are able to switch. Uh, this is the, like the synchronous commit, meaning that uh, for the commit to be like correct or okay, it needs to be committed to at least two or even more nodes uh, so that this would not happen at all. You won't lose any rights in this situation. So this, there is an interesting trade-off that you can like with the chaos engineering uh, approach, you are able to test it right away. You just switch uh, this attribute in the Postgres conf, you rerun the experiment again, and you can see the difference like almost immediately, which is very interesting. Also, if I will tell you that the switch over should be a planned action, there is a data loss. Another very interesting point is that when we kill primary pod, which is basically a failover, there are no errors at all. Uh, we can discuss this in depth uh, maybe later on, but this is like very interesting that the planned action actually for this particular scenario has worse results than the ad hoc failure. And for the last experiment, we have created uh, something like very artificial. So I will uh, remember, I will try to explain that we tried every two minutes to kill random pod also with its data there, with its PVC in the Kubernetes world. Uh, we don't care if this is primary or replica. So from the Postgres operator, you can see that there are almost, almost no disruptions. Maybe the last or, pre or, or some, some experiment uh, in the other half, um, killed the primary pod so you can see a very small number of failures but the, for the right cloud native p and uh, cloud native pg it is very different you can see that there is downtime maybe up after third fourth experiment etc and then after nine ten we kill the cluster itself so what does it mean for the first three scenarios this is like definitely what even the maintainers test this about uh, both of the operators are very stable. We can like count on them. Um, they are tuned to do this. For the fourth, this is much more artificial one. For example, the two minute like between the experiments, that is something I came up with. Uh, it is not, let, let's say, very, um, very in practice. You probably, will, it won't happen that every two minutes, uh, some of your pods would be killed, something like this. Uh, so even though, let's say, this, this was not um, a scenario that was practical, we learned a lot about how the cognitive PG behaves, or even for the, its competitor, for the Postgres operator, how well it behaves, and which was, let's say, I would say, at least for me, quite surprising. But all of these scenarios, like, uh, proven that the operators are comparable in terms of how they perform in the, let's say, real world. So we um, discussed what, uh, how far can we go with the resiliency testing, and we discussed, okay, when we uh, install a new Postgres cluster, there is typically a large number of steps that we do manually. Like when we install on the VM level, there are several experiments that we already do completely manually to prove that the cluster itself is stable, how does it behave, what are the, um, the downtime specifications, let's say, et cetera. Uh, so with Lithmos, we do have currently have that something that is much more repeatable. We are able to compare the results with the different configurations. We can evaluate real values. And uh, we even have, let's say, several different suits that one of, the, one of them is less disruptive. One of them is like full blown, let's try to kill this cluster or something like this. I would like to point out that uh, we are still, let's say, adopting, and we don't do like any distinct, like very complex scenarios. We just do a simple, very basic experiment, but this is very sufficient because when you, when I show you these experiments, um, and just as examples, what we do, typically in the manual steps, we, did, we didn't do much. So for example, when you uh, destroy a replica VM in the VMware originally, this is like very similar to the experiment I have shown before, right? Uh, so for all of these, let's say, experiments for resiliency testing, we have defined some very few, but some metrics that are important to us. And we try to understand what is happening. And with, let's say, some experience, we are trying to get some kind of baseline on this. Uh, 
the failover scenario is also like very interesting because if I restart a VM in the VMware, it is very well understand, but for the Kubernetes part, it is restarting primary port, which is very different. Or of course, there might be two options now. You could kill the node itself, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I'm just maybe trying to point out that for everything we did manually, there is already in Litmus some good alternative that is quite easy to enjoy and utilize. The switch over is uh, one thing that we don't currently uh, use Litmus for because it is done through a CLI tool and we are still trying to figure out how to connect this to Litmus. But you have seen uh, on the command line very similar example. How does it do for the cloud native PG? There is an extension to the kubectl which, uh, which can do it. Because like switch over is not a uh, changing of the declarative YAML part, the CRD that defines the cluster itself in Kubernetes, but it is imperative, so it is included in the tool. Uh, some, uh, let's say, advanced experiments is the overloading. And this is not about how about uh, availability mostly. This is also about measuring uh, transactions per second and other performance, let's say, behavior. So typically, we did like very simple overloading on the VM. Now we do have Litmus. Uh, pod CPU hook, which does basically the same, is uh, repeatable, and we are very happy to have it. Okay, maybe one more thing is, uh, is the last one, it's about the maintenance. So we are able to simulate typically the maintenance, meaning that we previously in the VM world, we just uh, shut every VM down. Currently, we are able to delete all the pods. Uh, I didn't mention that uh, there in the slide, but we also need to kill the operator itself, not to recreate them. And after a few whiles, we try to uh, start up operator again, if this will catch up, etc. cetera. And um, this is very interesting because you can imagine that uh, when we kill and restart and start over uh, VMs, it takes much longer time than uh, with the pods themselves. So for example, the shutdown uh, will take under five minutes and there is some, some even we did had some assumption for the, uh, how, does long, how long does it take to start the cluster? We are in uh, like much better numbers with the pods. Uh, there are those several problems that we faced and I would uh, like slightly trash, I apologize upfront, uh, Litmus quality. There are some like small details when you start with Litmus. You take some example from the manual. Sometimes it does not work. Sometimes you need to restart a pod uh, because suddenly chaos stops. Everything seems okay. After the pod restarts, everything starts uh, working again, etc. So if I may like slightly vote, I would definitely vote to keep the quality as high possible. All those, um, all what I mentioned is somewhere in the issues and we have faced like four or five, I guess, in the first week of experimenting with Litmus. And it stays there maybe for some weeks, so it's it might be improved. Um, still, we need to combine Litmus with some uh, bash scripting. This may be related to our, let's say, knowledge of Litmus itself, that um, running some, let's say, advanced behaviors probably would need also some, uh, some extending Litmus, etc. And for example, I mentioned the problem with the pod running outside the Kubernetes primitives, which requires even, let's say, more work. But in the end, this was like tremendously helpful to us. Uh, we were able to experiment, or, like do much better uh, and have much better understanding of how these operators behave for our mission critical systems. I would say that uh, very surprisingly to me, it was e much easier than I thought originally to simulate real world failure because I thought that, okay, we will need to set up very large environment, etc. It was not true. We just created a very basic experiment as you have seen. And this, these work well, very similar to our manual one. So we knew now move uh, much more towards some kind of metrics uh, control environment, maybe to some SLIs, SLOs in the end, we will see. But for example, if their developer comes to you and ask, okay, if I would have one node Postgres cluster, how does it behave? How, do, how long does it take uh, to restart, restore, etc.? Versus if I would get three nodes, is it different? And of course, if you will connect this to the price perspective for the developers, uh, this uh, question becomes much more interesting. If you have running, if you have a uh, hundred environments running, this is even more interesting. So these are, let's say, very practical results that we are able to get from the uh, this experimenting. And for our next steps, I would mention that we would uh, like we are maybe dreaming slightly about having uh, some experiments, very small. Uh, 
uh, non-disruptive in the production. But even though I have heard uh, so many of you <laughs> going in production, uh, we are still not fully convinced, I would say. So maybe in the, in the future, this might be our way. So thank you. And I am open to questions if there are any. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Hey, David. Yeah, thanks. Uh, it was a great presentation. I think uh, Postgres and specifically database is something really crucial and you covered pretty much uh, the whole thing. And uh, I do see there are a couple of questions. I was curious myself whether, whether I was learning from your presentation. So I had to myself, but let's start with the first one. So uh, Matthew asks, would a company need to do this testing for every application using Postgres? Or would they run the test once and then tune the system and then periodically run these tests? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, imagine that we have installed Postgres to our clients along with the main application that we provide typically. So yeah. we don't have tests for the application and Postgres behind it. We test the Postgres itself because we know that this is like a critical component and the application behaves like or failure patterns for the application are much more easily understood, something like something like this. So we test Postgres primarily. Now I have to, uh, first is I was curious about, um, you are targeting Postgres, so you're sort of doing chaos in the database range. So what sort of probes do you think would be useful when you're picking databases? Uh, well, for the probes, in the use cases I have shown you, we go fully end to end. Uh, and this is like the very large topic. I probably understand when, uh, where you are trying to head to, because if we would incorporate also the metrics from the database, yeah. uh, see some, uh, some health, let's say, uh, metrics integrated into the uh, chaos engineering and see, okay, this database, not only, let's say, perform at certain TPS level, but also the cached work this way, uh, the queries, uh, the P99 for queries was this low, et cetera, et cetera. This would like add another several, let's say levels of value to the testing itself, but we are not there yet. Even the black box and to end testing is uh, for us like very valuable currently. Got it. Okay. Sure. So um, one last question. So. Would you suggest creating custom faults uh, specific to the databases of Postgres, or do you think the faults that we have on Chaos Hub is enough to do the basic level database testing? Or like, I'm thinking uh, this question more in terms of uh, the current capability that we have. Is it okay to cover the database uh, cons, like you know, cover the database resiliency, or do you need to go the extra mile and create something yourself? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I will give you an example, or probably I'm already mentioned it. If you go with the Patroni based operator, the PGO, for example, there is a stateful set. Yeah. So if it runs through the studio, you are able to just select the stateful set and unleash chaos upon it. If you go with the cloud native PG, there is no primitive that like wrapped the pods. So in the studio, for example, itself, you don't know how to proceed probably. Okay. So it sort of depends on what you want. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. I think uh, that's about it. If you have any more questions in the audience, you can uh, add in the Q&A tab. But I think that's about it for now. It was a great talk, David, anyways. Uh, I learned a lot from it. And Thank yeah. you. It was very interesting. Bye. Yeah. Thank you so much. Bye.